Hi, I'm Whitney Donhauser, the Museum of the City of New York's Rone Mitchell Director and President. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for Your Hometown, a conversation with Suzanne Vega. This is the latest edition in our series of programs which accompany the podcast, Your Hometown, hosted by historian Kevin Burke, and featuring conversations with more than 20 guests who came of age in and around the five boroughs of New York City about how that time and place shaped them. The podcast officially launched this past February. You can learn more about the project and listen to yourhometown.org. We've been so thrilled to work with Kevin on both the podcast and the series of accompanying live conversations. Tonight, we're thrilled Grammy award-winning musician, Suzanne Vega could join us for the fourth conversation in this series. We are particularly excited to have Suzanne join us because the museum just opened a new exhibition, New York, New Music, 1980 to 1986, which explores the wide range of music from punk to hip hop, to pop, to salsa, to jazz, which exploded in the city during this time. Suzanne was an integral part of this cultural movement in the folk music revival of the era. If you haven't had a chance, we hope you'll come look at the exhibition. The museum is currently open Fridays through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The Your Hometown partnership between Kevin Burke and the Museum of the City of New York is made possible in part with support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and other generous donors. We'd also like to thank our member program sponsor, Fiduciary Trust International. And thank you to all of those who've joined us this evening who are able to donate for this event. We truly appreciate your support of the museum. If you're watching on Zoom, closed captioning is available for tonight's program, so you can enable that at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest and host. Suzanne Vega was born in Santa Monica, California, but grew up in East Harlem and the Upper West Side of New York City. She found a heady mix of multicultural music playing at home, Motown, Bossa Nova, jazz, and folk. At age 11, she picked up a guitar and as a teenager started to write songs. Vega went on to become a leading figure of the folk music revival of the early 1980s when, accompanying herself on an acoustic guitar, she sang what has been called contemporary folk or neo-folk songs of her own creation in Greenwich Village clubs. Since the release of her self-titled, critically acclaimed 1985 debut album, she has, been, she has had sold out concerts and many of the world's best known venues. Her most recent album is An Evening of New York Songs and Stories. Kevin Burke is the founder and CEO of Kevin Burke Productions, Inc., a New York-based film company and director of research at the Hutchins Center for African and American Research at Harvard University. So, and now I'll turn it over to Kevin and Suzanne. Hello. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I, I, and thank you, Whitney, for that wonderful introduction. It's been such a thrill to work on this series and to meet so many interesting New Yorkers whose childhoods have been, been marked by the city and shape of the people, the places and events that, that make it up and define it. And I thought that as a way of introducing our conversation tonight, I just thought we'd jump off from what Whitney was describing, which is a new exhibit at the museum, which is called New York uh, new, new Music, and focuses on this really renaissance period in, in the early 80s in New York, when you can sort of jump around the map of the city and see a flowering of new forms from hip hop, there's salsa, there are all those famous downtown clubs, you know, Paradise Garage and Mud Club and Danceteria. And this is also the period where you are emerging as an artist. You were graduating from Barnard College, which was not too far from where you grew up in the Upper West Side. And you were venturing out into the city as a songwriter and found yourself part of what we now look at as a really important moment in folk music called Fast Folk or the Folk Revival of the early 80s. And I was curious, it's one thing for historians to put a kind of a, a, kind of a label on an era or to kind of bound, put boundaries around it and say, this was what was happening. It's another thing to live it. And I was just gonna ask you, when you were kind of emerging, finding your voice, did you feel that you were part of something that was going on in New York or did it feel like you were part of something smaller and more, more focused? Um, it definitely felt like this was part of something going on in New York. 
um, the songwriters that I met uh, down in the in Greenwich Village of that era, we were very aware of what was going on in the rock and roll world, uh, what was going on at CBGB's. You know, we, maybe we wouldn't go there and hang out, but we would listen to the music. We listened to punk and new wave. Um, so there was a kind of mixing together of, of influences. Um, it wasn't just that we were sort of in this insulated little world, you know, uh, most of the people lived down on the Lower East Side. I lived uh, up on way up on 122nd at that point. Um, so we were aware of New York. And I think one of the interesting things, I mean, I was thinking about, I've got friends who have kids now who are in college who are thinking about becoming musicians and their path now is they write their music and they, they perform it in front of a camera like this, put it on YouTube, they have a channel. You didn't have any yeah. of those options. And in the podcast, you described how you sort of learned there was a hierarchy of clubs in New York. There was the bitter end, there was the bottom line. Of course, there was Folk City and you, you were sort of finding your way to those stages. And at one point, you basically rounded up a bunch of friends and people you knew from Barnard. I think you said 30 people and brought them down to see you perform at Folk City. And it, was, it, it felt very personal. And that was the way you spreaded the word it was really just by getting people you knew to come down and support you. And I was thinking about how you're finding your voice in this important time. And yet it's also, the birth of MTV is happening, you know, and yeah. how you thought of yourself sort of coming onto the scene when technology itself was changing, how, how artists were communicating was about to change in terms of from stages to the screen. Yeah, um, well, there was about five years between the two incidents that you're talking about. Um, that first time when I went down to Folk City, I, I, I had a mailing list. Um, I probably had 100 people, 150 people. So uh, I sent the uh, a flyer out to all of those people and 30 of those people came down. Most of them I didn't know. It wasn't like I was inviting my friends and neighbors. So I, I just sent the flyer out and 30 people happened to come down. Um, I was really thrilled with the idea of M MTV. I thought MTV was, was going to be this great liberation of art. It was going to be this fine uh, mixture of film and music and we would have, and some of it was, you know, some of Paul Simon's uh, music, some of uh, Peter Gabriel's um, videos were fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think I did my best uh, in the videos that I made. But overall, I think I was disappointed, say once we hit the nineties or even later, um, how quickly it, it all sort of fell apart. But in the beginning, I thought, wow, this is great. Uh, I love the police. I loved um, a lot of people. And I loved the whole idea of, the, of that kind of venue for, for music and art and film. And it was going to be this great burst of like genius art. <laughs> That's what I thought it was all going to be. <laughs> yeah, I think all of us had that hope. And then, as you say, it played out a little bit differently. Um, yeah. One of the things I thought was important to focus on was in the, in the podcast, you talked about how when you came to sort of writing music and finding your voice, feeling a certain amount of freedom to inhabit different perspectives and different characters was something that was important to you early on. You mentioned seeing Lou Reed perform at uh, Columbia when you were a student at Barnard and that kind of was a touchstone for you. And um, I was gonna ask you just growing up in New York and the, the sheer diversity and the, the, the spectrum of humanity here, how did your path toward that freedom um, how was it informed by being a New Yorker and growing up in the city, would you say? How did New York play a role in your sort of quest for this kind of freedom? Yeah, it, it, uh, I can't imagine how I would have written if I had come from a town where everyone was the same demographic, um, you know, where it's maybe a place more like, um, I don't know, my mother came from the Midwest, she came from, and, and so therefore it was more of a similar demographic. Um, but it, in my neighborhoods, it was wildly diverse. Uh, in East Harlem, we had mixtures of, of Black, Puerto Rican, Irish. Um, it, it, on the Upper West Side, we had Europeans of all kinds. Mm -hmm. You had different ages, different, um, just every kind of, of point of view you could imagine. Um, so that was important to me growing up, just the idea that you could see so many different kinds of people, just as though you were watching a play, you know, what do you tell, what can you tell from their clothing? Um, 
uh, for example. Um, and then secondly, there was all the art that was in uh, New York. Uh, you could go to poetry workshops, you could go see plays in the park, um, you could see sculpture, you could see all kinds of things. So it really forced you to use your imagination. Um, so if I wanted to write a song like Small Blue Thing, which I thought of as kind of sculptural almost, or like uh, almost like a, a, an animation, yeah. a film, I, was, I felt like I, wa I wanted to be a film. Um, so I, I could do that. I felt free to do that because that's how I, I had grown up with those concepts. Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing that, I, that really stuck with me when, when we spoke before for the interview is you said that you felt you had something to say and that your advice to young artists, people who are, who are thinking about careers in this, in this kind of calling, is if you have something to say, then, then, then pursue it. But that's the first thing, is that inner light, that inner calling, um, a feeling that you have something to contribute, and that's something that you, you uh, really saw uh, modeled in your home by your stepfather, Ed Vega, you mentioned, who was a, a novelist, and you saw other people in the city doing that. Later, it was Lou Reed, um, who became a friend. Um, but I think, it's also something we, we, we've heard Bob Dylan say, you know, he had something to say too. I, I know that's really important. And I was thinking that should be a liberating, right, piece of advice. Like just, if you have something to say, you say it. But also I think for people who may not feel like their stories matter, like who am I? And I'm in the city of 9 million people. Um, it can sometimes feel, it can sometimes feel small and the city can feel as if it's looking at you with indifference. And I think feeling that confidence to say, I do have a truth, I do have a story to tell, it, that's a, that's a, that takes a real um, sense of courage, but also selfhood. And I was going to kind of ask you, um, thinking about that a little further, like if you, were, if you were someone who feels this well of, you know, feelings inside, but may, may feel like people are not going to listen or care or see me. You've, you've had this really long career, but you said you've ups and downs. What would you say to people who feel like my story doesn't matter? You know, even if they feel like they have something to say, you know, no one will care. You don't know. You don't know if people are going to care. And that's not really the point in the end. You're not doing it for the attention, it, which may sound kind of weird. I mean, you put yourself on a stage and generally people will look at you and decide if they like you or they don't like you. But you won't know ahead of time. Um, so do it. <laughs> because, you know, uh, it, you can feel shy. I was very shy. I was very introspective. Yeah. Um, sometimes people looked at me with all the wrong intentions. You know, I hated some of the people who looked at me in the beginning when I would go down to audition at the bitter end. Um, so there were times where I, ha I hated being looked at. Um, but I also understood that if you're going to stand on a stage, people will look at you and they will judge you. So even if one person said, you really moved me, or I really loved your lyrics. Um, that was enough to yeah. make me come back again in two weeks. Um, one person. So it's really not up to you to prejudge yourself. It's not for you to say, oh, they won't like me. You have no idea what's gonna happen when you get up there. So go do it. I think that's such important advice. <laughs> that's what really I have to say. And I hope yeah. everyone who's listening takes that to heart because it, that's, I think, one of the one of the rivers that people have to cross when they're thinking about doing anything in life that they really are passionate about is that what if, you know, I put it out there and there's just silence. And, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to um, artists who were part of the era that, that Whitney was describing the museum being about who said that one of the exciting things about moving to New York in that period, late seventies, early eighties, was that it was local. The city had come, was coming out of the financial crisis. So there were elements to it that, that made it a little bit uh, uncertain in terms of, of safety and the things that we're talking about today. But, yeah, sure. but they said that you could, you could make your art, you could make a song, you could cut a demo and you could feel that there was a very good chance that it was gonna get played. You could bring it to a club and a DJ would play it. Your friends would come. You might put, put up a sign on a lamppost or in a zine magazine and people would come and these some of these people are now composers writing for television and they say that even though they're at this point in their career they put songs out now through you know Spotify or and that's more silence that they're getting now than they had when they were starting out because of that local communal aspect to New York at that time which I think is something to think about as we're thinking about nurturing and, and helping our artists today coming out of the pandemic 
Um, so without further ado, one thing I wanted to treat the audience to, which was just wonderful, is that you actually put together a slide uh, presentation for us of, of images from your archive that yes. some have really not been seen before that give a tour of your childhood, almost if, as if we're you know sitting in a room together at, at, with a carousel of, of old pictures. It's wonderful. And I thought we could cue those now and maybe just walk through them together. This is sort of your first act yeah. of life. So there you okay. are. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm very young here. I think I'm six months old. Um, I, I think I was actually born with a happy disposition. Um, and this picture to me is sort of, must have been my true nature. Um, so that's why I include it there. It's, the beginning. Wonderful. Here's my mother and my stepfather shortly, I believe they just came to New York City. It was the beginning of their relationship. Uh, there's my mom, obviously, uh, on the right, and Ed Vega, my mom, Pat Vega, and my stepfather, Ed Vega. Uh, here they are again later on. This is probably from the 70s. Um, so even though they had a difficult um, relationship at times, there were times where there was a lot of joy and a lot of closeness. So I wanted mm -hmm. to show that. This is Ed in the early 60s. Um, uh, this is very uh, much the look of the time. Um, I remember seeing a lot of men looking like this in East Harlem at that time, probably the early 60s. And one thing you mentioned in the interview, which really stuck with me, is that he went to mar March with Martin Luther King in 63, the March on Washington, yes. and that you remember feeling afraid for him, that you were aware enough that he, and he's an activist, very engaged in politics, that you had the sense that this was something that he was doing that could be dangerous. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I knew that he was a, a man with brown skin and that uh, this could be dangerous for mm -hmm. him. And I remember feeling that and feeling relief when he came home. Yeah. There he is again, uh, a bit later on, I guess, in uh, probably, this is probably 65 by now. There's my mom, uh, Pat Vega. Uh, there, there's this street behind her. I chose this picture instead of other more close up portraits because you can really see what the street looked like um, and the little yard. We our, our house was different than the others because we had a little front yard mm -hmm. and there she is. Um, standing with that um, street life going on behind her. And this is on 109th Street, right? East 109th Street? 109th, yep. yep. 304 East 109th Street, yeah. This is Ed Vega playing pool. <laughs> I always thought it was a very evocative photo. You know, he, he was a guy yes. with a lot of charisma. Yeah. This one I brought, but this is my brother Matthew standing at the back of our house. Uh, this is the back part of that house. The, the house itself was very old and I think was built sometime around the Civil War era, probably um, 1860. It might have been around that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that's a very um, just an, an evocative uh, picture. Absolutely. In the episode, you described people throwing garbage in that back. Yeah, so there's the fence there to prevent us from just running out into the yard. Yes. Um, so Matthew, you know, he's kind of there against the fence looking out into yeah. where he, he can't really go there. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the kitchen. And uh, this is exactly the way I remember our life. Um, Timothy was just born. He's in the carriage. I'm feeding him with a bottle and my sister Allison is there. And it was always once the once we had four children, it, it was always a sense of chaos um, going on in the house. And my parents were so young, and there were so many of us. Yeah. Uh, um. So this is very much the way I remember it. I'm helping to feed Timmy. Allison's running around. Who knows where Matthew is? Um. So that's that's why I included that one. And one thing that comes through in the episode too is how close you all were. I mean, you were the oldest of this of the yeah. four of you, but you describe how you know we were talking in the context of your song Gypsy how touch was important to you and that when you think about that the most when you were a kid, you think about it in the context of them and the, and the four of you kind of being in bed, snuggling, cuddling um, and being very yes. close together, if the four of you. And that they're all artists in different yes. ways. Yes, and here's a photo that shows that. It's me and my sister, Allison. Yes. Uh, I'm sort of, I was more shy than she was in terms of facing a camera. Allison was very photogenic. Uh, we can see her huge eyes here and mm -hmm. I was much more, inhibited by the camera. 
but we were always sort of together. Um, you know, yeah, we felt very comfortable, uh, you know, wrestling or cuddling or, you know, whatever. Um, yes. So here we, here we are kind of together in this um, photo. I love that photo. Mm. This, uh, yeah, it might have been, uh, these, some of these photos must have been taken by Hiram Maristani. Uh, there were a, a couple of brothers on the block, Hiram Maristani and Eric Maristani, and they came and took photos of a lot of us. Here we are, me and my sister again, in the backyard, and you can see the garbage in the back. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a little pile of it there in the back. Yes. Uh, that was just the way it was. That was life. Uh, these were dresses made by our grandmother, by Ed's mother. And you talked about how how welcome they welcoming they they were to you and nurturing his family that you feel, yes. really felt embraced by them. Yeah. yeah, and that meant a lot to me. Um, it's still I still think of them constantly. Yeah. Uh, here we are again in the backyard. It's me, Allison, and Matthew. And there's Allison again with the sort of greeting that camera. Yes, and um, right. So this next photo is sort of a more formal picture of all of us kind of dressed up in our best uh, when the photographer must have come in and, and this is a bit more formal. Again, Timmy is probably a month or two old at this point. Uh, this is me attempting to play the piano. Um, <laughs> uh, I've never learned to play the piano, but as you can see, I had an interest in it. Um, Eventually, I learned that my actual birth father was a pianist and, yeah, and played, played the piano. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's kind of an interesting shot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here you can see Ed's love of learning. Um, he had the alphabet. This is the front room in uh, 109th Street. He has the alphabet and all the numbers printed on the wall. Uh, we played a lot in this front room and you can see I'm there. I've discovered a, um, a record player. So, yes. and I probably had learned how to use it. I'm only four or five there, but, uh, and there's Allie peeking out from under the cubby hole. <laughs> uh, so this room was very alive because we were always playing in there. And Ed had also drawn sort of little folk pictures, paintings of one of, of me, uh, which I don't have any photograph of, but I was excited to see the letters and the numbers because as I said, we spent so much time in that room and it really mattered to him that we knew how to, uh, that we learned the alphabet and that we knew how to count. There I am in first grade. By this point, I've started school, and uh, I my this is from the first grade in East Harlem. Okay. This is probably my very first selfie ever. Uh, <laughs> I'm probably I'm probably like ten or eleven at this point. Um, not a very happy child, but um, I felt it was a kind of an interesting portrait of that moment in time. I'm probably yeah, yeah. eleven. And, and knowing that your story and having spoken to you about it, if the, the difference, the kind of jump between the last photo and this photo, so many things happened, you know, and, and you get into this a little bit in the interview, uh, the podcast, which is at eight, age eight, you ran away, which people can learn about that and sort of what, what led to that and where you went. I'll give a hint, it's mm -hmm. Riverside Park. Um, and, <laughs> and then the year later, when you were nine, you learned that you were not Ed Vega's daughter. He was your stepfather. And that that you were not Susan Vega um, in, in in a technical sense, uh, and right. so um, that was a that, that was a massive ripple effect in your life too. So things were things had happened in your life. Things had changed. You can see that just in those two photos. Yeah. Yes, uh, I agree. So um, so now we have a huge leap forward, and now this is the early '80s. So this was the front of Folk City. Um, oh, wow. And this is everybody. I think Matthew was away at school, and mm -hmm. uh, this is the whole family. There's my mom standing next to me, Allison, Timothy, and Ed over here at the at the end. So they would come down sometimes and see me sing, and this was an exciting period for me. This is the period that we're talking about, yes. uh, the early '80s. Yeah. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. All right. There we go. I mean, thank you. I mean, that was just. Uh, wonderful to see all that and thank you so much I, I, I the carry that you put into it means a lot and I think people who are watching got a lot out of, a lot out of that and looking at that last photo I thought we could just 
jump off from there, which is we talked a lot about uh, Luca in the interview, and and that's one of your, you know, songs that most people uh, know and have feelings about and associations with. And without getting into the full kind of story of that and what we talk about in the interview, um, since it's so deep and so so meaningful, I want people to listen to it in full. I, I just want to ask you as a follow up to to the interview. Um, I asked you then what your siblings thought when the song came out, what your mom thought when the song came out. And it was a it was an interesting moment in our exchange because you said that when that song came out, you actually focused more on what Ed Vega thought of the song. Uh, you were afraid of yeah. his reaction uh, since the uh, given the content. So I was gonna ask you just since we spoke in January and, and now the interview's out, have you gone back and asked your, your siblings or your mom what they thought? I have not actually. Um, it just hasn't keep come the street up. Going. Uh, you know, <laughs> life keeps going on, and there's all these other yes. emergencies and things that keep yes. rising up, and things that I need to talk to them about. So uh, it, it hasn't come up, and and uh, so I, I I still don't know what they thought of it when it came out. Um, and maybe one day I will. But uh, in the meantime, it's been you know just other, dealing with other things that everything every week there's a new thing to to talk about. That I totally understand. Um, it, it's a, it's an in interesting moment in the in the interview. And I encourage people to listen to it. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad to know. So the mystery remains and the street continues. That we <laughs> but when yes. you do ask them, I would love to yes. know the answer. Okay. All right. Um, this is such an important song, and you know it's interesting because when you do an interview, we had that had our time together, and then in making the show, you you kind of listen to the audio over and over again as you're as you're editing it and you're putting this in the sound and music. So I sort of was immersed in your music before I interview and then after. And, the, and it's interesting how those songs work their way through your system. And, and Luke is just one that it just instantly when it comes on, I feel something and I, I'm, and I'm in, that, in, in that song. And it's, it's amazing to me all these years later how you were able to conjure that just through words and, and, and music, a real feeling of that place um, and that, that apartment. Um, Thinking about families and, and sort of being kids ourselves. And then as we age, we sometimes become parents, many of us, and we have a chance to make families of our own. And I was going to ask you, you know, in terms of New York, you were both a kid here, and that's the subject really of our interview, but you're also a parent. Um, and how, when you made that transition, you thought about things from your own childhood that you wanted to bring forward, um, or maybe they even surprised you that, that they reappeared. And versus things that you wanted to leave behind. And as you kind of compare your childhood to, to, to the one that you nurtured, both in New York, a kind of how you yeah. look at those two lenses, both as the kid and as the parent. Yes. Um, the things I wanted to take with me were the sense of being open to art everywhere, uh, a sense of freedom. I wanted my daughter to be the kind of person that could be on a subway um, mm -hmm. or on a on a on a bus to that would feel free to walk around, um, but also so not just always taking cabs or taking um, you know uh, private transportation. I wanted her to feel free and confident, yeah. um, and that was a different world than the one I grew up in. I mean, I had to take the subway, uh, but she didn't necessarily had have to. So I wanted her to feel free. Um, the one, the one thing I, I that came to mind when I saw this question was I remembered her first day of school, her first day of private school, and I don't know. Uh, I told her this in front of my sister, who was a teacher at the school. Um, I said to my daughter, "If somebody hits you, um, hit them back as hard as you can first, and then go tell the teacher." And my daughter was like, what? Uh, and my sister was telling me, no, no, you know, that's not how things in private school, you know, no one's going to hit anybody else. Um, so, and I realized later that that was true, but I mean, I, I thought I was giving her some useful advice. This is the kind of advice that Ed would have given me. Um, so over time, I realized, of course, that was she didn't need that kind of advice. Uh, her world was a lot more sophisticated uh, socially. She had to learn more uh, socially sophisticated things than than I did. Mm -hmm. um, so and and that counted uh, counts too, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, and and you mentioned that when you were growing up, it it was a tougher neighborhood on 102nd Street, and that you, yeah. you would get into fights and people would get in your face and. 
ask you all kinds of things. And you said fighting was almost their way of getting to know you <laughs> and figuring out what you could yeah. put up with. And then if you didn't stand up for yourself, uh, it would just keep going. So you sort of had to, even though it wasn't innate and instinctive to you, you sort of had to do it. Um, and yeah. so I can see why you that was your to. advice <laughs> to your daughter. Right, I was, thought I was being helpful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, I, I, I realized once, once the school year began and I saw how it all worked, um, but still sometimes you need, you know, even if you're not gonna be physically, um, uh, you still need to have the courage to stand up for yourself, even if it's not physical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that. It's also interesting too, because we t it, it's thinking about different New Yorks. So Ed Vega had his New York of the forties, let's say, and you had your New York of the seventies and then your daughter had her New York later on. And each yeah. one is in their own New York and mm -hmm. especially for a young person. And so, and they're not the same, you know, and you, you're, it's the same physical place, but time changes and the, and the, the zeitgeist changes and the norms change. So, and that can be true also by neighborhood and where, where you are and, and not only just by, by era. So it is interesting how you can be in the same place but have radically different childhoods in, in, yeah. in that way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I don't wanna deny people any longer. You have graciously and generously agreed to sing a song. Um, one of your iconic songs, Tom's Diner, um, which for those who don't know, you wrote in 1982, you had graduated from Barnard the year before and you were walking up Broadway and, and had this sound in your mind. And we all are the beneficiaries of that. And for those who don't know, Tom's Diner is on 112th and Broadway. It's Morningside Heights, right by the Columbia University campus. I've been there a lot in recent years because my, my son loved to go get pancakes there. Um, but just for those who, who, who also associate with Seinfeld, this was, seven years before Seinfeld's debut that you, that you were there writing the song. Um, so with, with that, I would love to just give you the floor to in an acapella way, just sing the song for us, which we all love. Okay, so here's how it was actually written. I am sitting in the morning at the diner on the corner. I am waiting at the counter for the man to pour the coffee and he fills it only halfway. And before I even argue, he is looking out the window at somebody coming in. It is always nice to see you, says the man behind the counter to the woman who has come in. She is shaking her umbrella. And I look the other way as they are kissing their hellos and I'm pretending not to see them. And instead I pour the milk. I open up the paper, there's a story of an actor who had died while he was drinking, it was no one I had heard of, and I'm turning to the horoscope and looking for the funnies when I'm feeling someone watching me, and so I raise my head, there's a woman on the outside looking inside, does she see me? No, she does not really see me, because she sees her own reflection, and I'm trying out to notice that she's chain up her skirt and while she's straightening her stockings her hair has gotten wet oh this rain it will continue through the morning as i'm listening to the bells of the cathedral i am thinking of your voice and of the midnight picnic once upon a time before the rain began. And I finish up my coffee and it's time to catch the train. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. As you were telling the story through song, I was just thinking everyone has been that person in a different way. Like we've been in those positions in the city, especially those who live here, um, and how there are moments when the city can feel alienating and there are moments when the city can feel really connected 
And there's so much going on in that song. And I was thinking today was one of the first times I took the subway in a long time in New York. I had to go uptown for a funeral of all things. And just sitting there and being back immersed on a train and just the, the way that people interact with one another and around space, similar to a crowded diner in certain ways. Um, and that song I think just resonates for so many people because it's just, we, we've been there, we've been in that, in that scene. Um, and you know, and that song was written, we're going back to what we talked about earlier, MT was new. And, and then that song eventually would become part of a next generation technology, the MP3, which is amazing for people who yeah. should look this up who don't know that story, it's remarkable. It's staying in power and it's and it's sort of ubiquity in our in our in our, in our uh, consciousness. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, but I was gonna say that during our interview, we talked a little bit of that paradox in New York between alienation and connection. And in the song, there is alienation that comes from people missing each other, not seeing each other. But there's also connection that comes through a memory that you have of this midnight pit picnic. And it's just really a, such a wonderful duality. And uh, when we talked about it in the interview, you said that you no longer felt that same sense of alienation that you did when you were younger and writing that song. Um, but now here we are coming through a pandemic where we haven't been able to be in places like Tom's in a long time. And this was really brought home for me because I lived uh, on 115th Street in Riverside uh, up until a few months ago. And so Tom's was part of my life and it had gone from a tourist destination to someplace that was sort of part of my family and then it was closed. It was really strange to see it close in March of 2020, just dark. And then it reopened just for takeout and then you know, right, delivery right. and then slowly but surely the tables outside opened up again. And then now it's back, but it, it, it had this chapter that no one could have imagined and there it was, but now it's back. So all this is to say that if, if you were thinking about your own attachment to places like that, and thinking about where you are now and having come through the pandemic like all of us, what would what do you think you would want to say now about places like Tom's? I mean, Tom's Diner, the song is a moment of time, but your own relationship to, to space is like that now. How do you think of them uh, today? I still love them. Um, and of course, it's wonderful when they do come back. Um, because some of them didn't, uh, you know, uh, there were places that were very meaningful to me, for, to me and my husband, for example, and yeah. now they're, they, they're gone. I, I don't yeah. know if they'll ever come back. So now we have them in our memory and we have mementos of them and then we have to kind of let it go and find new places uh, that will be that for us. Um, or we can find another place uh, like Metro Diner, <laughs> you know, if to Times Diner. Love close, Metro. Go to Metro Diner. Yeah, yeah, I love Metro too. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, we have to, we can't cling to everything. We've got to be able to let it go and kind of let it be its fluid thing as we go on in our life. And we just have to recreate it somewhere else and with, with other people people um and and in a weird way we are sort of doing that now in cyberspace uh we we form groups and places where we feel comfortable um uh it, that's kind of a new dimension for us these days yeah. to commune and i was going to ask you just specifically as someone who does perform and tours and is used to being in front of people what this last 15 16 months were like for you um you know in terms of just being someone who is connected with time, like here you are. Yeah. And it's wonderful to have moments like this. And I know you've done other things like this from your home uh, that are meaningful to people and I think are really worth celebrating. But still, you're an artist who, who, who you know, is used to, used to being out there. What has this been yeah. like? And what has it been like to see other artists going through this too? It's been really strange. Um, I, I can't say I've gotten used to it. I mean, I'm a person who's used to touring. Uh, fortunately, uh, my husband and I not only love each other, but we really like each other. And so we've kept things very entertaining between the two of us throughout the whole pandemic. And uh, we have film festivals and we watch a lot of movies and we talk about them. And um, so we keep things alive and interesting, but uh, I do miss touring and I do miss getting out there and singing. Um, I miss that live, that, that touring life. Yeah, so I'm going to start again in the fall. Oh, that's great. Right now, yeah, we're just going to start, I think, September 11th, actually, is the beginning of a, of a tour around, sort of around the northeast of, of America. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. 
Um, I yeah. know the 20th anniversary of 9-11 is coming up, which is hard to believe. I mean, it really is uh, two decades ago. It's, it's, it seems surreal to think about that. Um, but yeah. also in the interview, we, you know, we talked a little bit about that because it's connected to your brother, Tim. Um, so again, another reason for people to listen is that you explain sort of losing him not that long after 9-11 and how that uh, informed your oh, They were connected. Too. Yeah, yeah they were connected and, and connected to place too through the Fireman's Memorial on 100th 100 Street and Riverside Drive and someone you met there, a graffiti artist named Zephyr and, and sort of yeah. how you connected through memories of, your, of that time in the 70s, but also for your brother. So there's so many moments in the interview, I can't summarize them all, but I just encourage people to go listen to it um, because it's really, I think, such an illuminating interview and um, a look into the, the life of an artist, but also the formation of an artist. It's really, it's really quite powerful. Um, one thing we talked a little bit toward the end of the interview, and I wanted to revisit here because we we're just talking about diners and, and restaurants that have closed and gone, is that there are also ghosts in New York. Right, and we've talked about this, um, you and I, before. That we're, we're, we are interested in history, and we're very mindful of the past, and we're mindful of ghosts, and not even our own ghosts, but people who are. You know, you mentioned uh, when we spoke that you that you saw a photo of two of the founders of Mad Magazine, and, and that sent you on a trip yeah. thinking about their lives in the '30s, and how New York is just full of those layers of history, kind of, and at every corner there's depth of story there, and 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 memory, and how. Um, they're part of being a New Yorker too when you're here long enough. But you also said that uh, rummaging around too much in the past can be something that you have to be careful about. And I think for me as an historian, that's all I do for a living is rummage around in the past, but we have to balance that of course with the present. And that you you said that uh, recently that you you feel like you've really begun to integrate your whole hometown story, right? You know, the, the different chapters of your life and how they fit together and that, that has brought a certain amount of peace, that integration. And I was going to ask you just as we as we get ready to close tonight, how that's going for you uh, in terms of just your, that sort of holistic integration of memory and, and not feeling haunted so much, but feeling that all of these memories form the book of Suzanne Vega um, and, and how uh, it's informing your work as you, as you think about the future and you think about going back on the road and bringing that those stories and those memories and that life with you? Well, um, it's going slowly. That's how it's going. Um, you know, over time and uh, as I've lived out my life and certain things that I used to wonder, like, uh, was I going to have children? Was I going to be a mother? And so these things have been answered. Uh, now this, I'm in my early 60s now, so I feel like I can look back and there was a, a very, there was a, a, a thread that was very mm -hmm. continuous. Um, I have to say one thing that made our this podcast uh, different, this interview that you and I did back in January different is that uh, it's probably the first time I've ever said in public that I am Luca, um, because yes. most of the time I've been, con I don't know what the word is, not content, but most of the time I just leave it as, there was a boy, he lived upstairs, he was not abused. I've known other people who were. And most of the time people don't explore it any deeper than that. So you being a historian, uh, you sort of, you knew the answer before we had the interview. So I, I knew that. <laughs> so I thought, okay, we're gonna go with this. Um, so this is a, uh, the first time really that I've been able to fuse that with myself and say that out loud in public to, to an audience. Um, and I think that's really meaningful. Um, it was powerful to me to experience it. And one um, of the things, yes, and, and Susan, I was going to ask you about this, and it's something that, again, you have to listen to the interview to, 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 to go here with us. But one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is I've been listening to the, the cuts and refining and, and finally locking the episode is that you mentioned uh, Ed Vega, sort of a, a really important figure in this whole story. You said growing up with him was sort of like the weather, you know, the, the weather could change, like it's a sunny day and now it's yeah. raining here in New York. And that was sort of like living with him. And he's someone that chose a life of words, a life of the mind. He was a writer, but sometimes those words gave out and, and he could be violent. And and, and you, you talked about how when Luca came, Luca came out, you were scared of his reaction because he might know that it was you and, and you sort of danced around it. And, and I think people should experience that fully in the interview. But you also mentioned one other thing about him that I wanted to say, which is, you said that you've learned and that you've realized that part of this came from, 
frustrations. Part of it came from the fact that he was uh, sort of living in New York at a time where coming from Puerto Rico, this was not easy uh, for him. It was, it was very difficult for him, but also that he himself had been uh, abused as a child. And that yes. this was when he so in, in a sense, the song was for him as well. Yes, so it was, that's what I wanted to it ask was you. me. Yes. But it was also him. I've been um, dying to ask you the question, which it's, you could read the song as also it's Ed's story. He's Luca too. Yeah, I, I really feel that that's true. That's not something we ever discussed, but no. it's something that I feel is true. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I later when I went, after we spoke, I went back and found video of him. I saw him giving a, a, a talk somewhere about one of his novels. It was before an Irish literary society. And he was, he had an affinity for <laughs> Irish culture. Yeah, he was around yeah, it in the, in the Bronx. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he talked about that, that, you know, that he didn't, it wasn't an easy childhood. He had to, he had to prove himself and it was not, and so even though it's sort of, you can, people are, you can hold complexity in your mind, right? That's real truth is complexity. And you can both feel, feel for the situation that you guys were in as kids being around a force like that and simultaneously feel for him because there's a kid inside of each of us, right? That's sort of the whole premise of your hometown yeah. is that inside of each of us, there's a child. And, and as we age, that kid is still there. Um, and yeah. I feel like as you were growing up, Ed was larger than life. He was tall, he was big, he was imposing, but that kid was inside him too. So yes. I, I want people, if they when they leave our talk tonight and they go listen to the episode, keep that in mind. Like think about that, the complexity of the human condition, right? And that he was someone who also, uh, motivated you to pursue your own truth. And in doing that, you, in, in the end, shined a light on him, right? You, you sort of, you, you emulated his own quest for freedom and truth in, in his, his work in your own. And in pursuing your truth, you've given us Luca, which has now sort of brought him into different, a different view. Just think there's so many layers to this uh, that are layers of meaning. And I wanted to thank you just for being willing to be so honest and to, and to and so generous with sharing your story because this is not a show that's just you know back in my day it's a show about really seeking right seeking meaning in our past and the stories that we carry forward with us and you went there and it humbled me and i think it's it's something i won't forget i mean i really uh admire you admire you so much for sharing that and also just reminded myself in doing this, how much your songs mean to me. And I know that there are, in seeing the episode go out today and the conversation online on Facebook and people writing to me, your truth connected to other people's truth. That's something we talked about, but I'm seeing it. Like your, your music really is part of people's lives. And when you're a writer like you, uh, who is seeking the truth, that's the ultimate right uh, validation in the sense that your art has become other people's stories too, that they are also Luca. And that is something that I think part of your, your reluctance to, to open up about it when, you, when the song came out is, why get between their experience of the song and, and yours? You know, there's your personal side of Luca, but it's, it's also open to that for them to make it their own. And I think for all these years, yeah. you've allowed that to happen organically and it has happened. Yeah, I felt for a long time it didn't matter uh, if it happened to me. The, what mattered was that it was true, that it was a true story. Um, and I still want the emphasis to be on the work itself. Um, that's, yeah, that's how I, that's, that's why I haven't brought it up until this moment in time. Yeah. I, yeah. I did feel though that to keep it to myself longer would be, would start to be, become twisted. Like it would be coy to, especially for someone who did the amount of research that you did, you know, you really, you connected those dots, you went back in time, you really did that research and you came to me saying, this is what I, this is what I found. So I wasn't gonna go, no, 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 you're wrong. I, I mean, I, you were, you were correct. So oh. I, I wanted to say that you got it. You, you found it. You well, found the you. answer to oh. the riddle. Yep. And that's, I mean, I think it's a, it's something just for all of us as we leave and we, we have Whitney close for us tonight. Just to, to remind ourselves that in this polarized time we're in, and right, and, and, and time of, of great turmoil, that just a simple conversation, there's beauty in just listening to one another, and and really, you know, finding uh, a connection. And I think that's what we were able to do. And I think that's what I'm hoping to be able to do the series. And I just the series is better because you were in it. I just thank you so much. You are you are a New Yorker's New Yorker, and 
you're also a poet. And um, anyway, I, I just hope people can can spend the time with the episode and and listen because I think they'll they'll go on that journey with you and and they won't hear your music the same way again, but they'll hear it in a deeper way. Um, anyway, that's that's the magic of of just talking and listening. So thank you so much, Suzanne. I see thank we need you. you back to close this out for us. I and again, am. thank you everyone for being part of this tonight. It was special. I knew it would be as is this show and as is this partnership with the museum, which is the best museum in New York City because it tells the story of New York from the ground up. So with that, well, Suzanne, thank you and Whitney, thank, thank you for having us. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I think the power of conversation certainly came out and also the power of artistry, uh, the power of creation, what Suzanne is able to create um, in her music, in her poetry, all of that um, is so strong. And the sense of place in New York has come through. So um, we're very grateful to have been um, the host of tonight and to collaborate with Kevin on these important conversations, which uh, really illuminate so much um, about New York as a backdrop. So thank you, Suzanne, for not only performing for us tonight, but also sharing those um, wonderful photographs. Of course, Hiram Marisami is someone who's so important as far as the creative life of New York City. So it's wonderful that he's around um, and in the museum. So we would love for people to come back and see um, your music um, as shown through the 1980s exhibition um, and see it in the bigger context. And we're so grateful for your giving us time tonight and being so generous um, with your stories. It's been really, really meaningful. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>